Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. Weather doesn't stop us. We're always filming. Uh, it's just the two of us today. I'm Tyler Norton, joined by John Bergman, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And of course, you can read his competition recaps at climbing.com. Uh, and we're talking about Seoul today. It was a speed and boulder doubleheader. And Big stories all around, but of course, speed climbing absolutely took uh, uh, took all of the headlines for the most part. Um, before we get into it, I just want to throw a shout out to uh, the Canadian Climbing Federation. They are looking for donations uh, to run their Youth Nationals live stream this season. So if you're somebody that watches live streams, particularly youth climbing in Canada, you might be the kind of person that wants to support their donation effort. Uh, there's a link in the description below, so you can throw a few bucks to try and make a live stream happened for the Canadian Youth Nationals in 2023. Uh, after that, let's just get into it. Um, John, we started watching this, first of all, with uh, getting to see the qualification round of speed climbing for the first time. I don't, I actually don't know if you tuned in for that. Did you manage to see any of that qualification action? Because of course, it was, it was full of hype. It was like, this is the first round of the year. Are we going to see the record broken? I did tune in to it. And didn't you get the sense that the IFSC was thinking the same thing that everybody else was thinking, which is that, yeah, sure. world records are probably going to get broken here. Everybody wanted to see the the qualification because, pe as fans know, that's when records usually get broken. Although this was uh, obviously this event proved to be a little bit of an exception there uh, in that records were broken in the final round as well. But it, yeah, it felt like the IFSC knew that something special was going to happen in the qualification round. So they decided to do it. I love that they that they did that. That there was sound for some of it, but not for most of it. Didn't matter. It was still great to watch every every beat everybody do uh, some re really fast runs, to say the least. It was a uh, yeah. If we if we go back to just last year, uh, for the men's side, at six of seven six of the seven competitions in 2022 the fastest time of the comp was set during qualification. Six of seven on the men's side, four of seven on the women's. So all of those records that Kiramal and Ola broke, they were all from qualifications, I think. I think every single one of them last year was in qualification. So it makes sense. Historically, that's not actually that that uh, uh, frequent. Normally, it's a pretty good distribution across all the rounds, but recently, it's absolutely qualifications. And yeah, I'm glad we got to see it because we got to see uh, uh, Vedrick put down new times and uh, Alexandra twice put down new times. It was pretty wild. Uh, and of course, it was nice to see the big names that didn't make finals see how they actually performed because normally we would just see a time that was a little bit subpar, uh, but not really know what happened exactly. So getting to see... Uh, Eric from Spain drop out with, I think it was a false start, right? Um, and then Kiramal, first time in his World Cup history of speed climbing, didn't make a finals. That was, you know, let alone the fact that he wasn't the one that set the world record. Not making finals was a shocker by itself. It goes back to something that we said, I think it was in our year-end awards slash kind of a preseason hype debrief that we did just a, a few weeks ago, which is that Kiramal for... For all his wonderful accolades, and he certainly has solidified himself as one of the most important characters in the history of speed climbing, uh, he's got all these world records to his name, but he doesn't actually have that many uh, podiums slash uh, maybe gold medals would be a better way to say it. Uh, he and, and this was... Uh, kind of like that accentuated it was you know um, so it, it just goes to kind of goes to show like when you're analyzing the the career of a speed climber or the great performance of a speed climber what are you really weighing most are you weighing consistent appearances in a finals in the case of somebody like Alexander Miroslav obviously that's a significant metric are you weighing maybe gold medals? Are, are you weighing world records? And I know that we had this great discussion with Eddie about all this. And eh, it's, an it's, interesting case it's a good here. thing I picked him as my as my uh, male climber of the year for last year, because if he keeps up this kind of form, it's not going to happen uh, this time around. Like, honestly, it's he's been so consistent at performing highly in qualifications that, you know, it, it was stunning to see him just not get a good run together uh, this time around. Like, he didn't fall start. He didn't have, like, a, a, an official fall, um, right? Like, he finished all of his runs. Just the times were were not great. Um, but let's talk about, instead, the people that actually made stuff happen. And, of course, Vedrick uh, 
breaks the record twice, once in qualies, once in, am I right, saying quarterfinals? Um, yeah, quarterfinals. And then Alexandra Mirosaw, both of her runs in qualies, chipped down the time, and then again in semis, and then again in finals, which is the dream, set the new world record in a final. Um, it was absolutely stunning and just a continuation of last season. And we're going to have to get somebody to talk about this soon. We'll get an athlete that we can talk to. Um, but it this makes, I'm not going to say it makes no sense, but this is such a sea change from the history of speed climbing where a world record was a rare occasion that you were lucky to see. And now it's almost a guarantee that if you tune into a speed competition, you're going to see a new world record. It's such a, uh, uh, such a different, uh, it's just a change of pace. And I hope that down the road, somebody makes some sort of documentary about this, because I think this is the anomaly in sports. I, it's not normal to have world records broken so, so repeatedly for, for years on end. Right. I, I think maybe, OK, somebody breaks a record once every every year or every two years or every five years. This is just wild, and I don't think it's going to continue. I mean, it can't. If you think about just human potential, right? At some point, logic would tell you this has to level out a little bit, which which goes to just – we're just in such a special, unique time in here. And and this reminds me – let's talk about Vedrik and, and his world records first because it feels kind of fitting that Vedrik – set this world record. He's the first athlete that takes us into this hallowed sub five second realm, 4.98. And then he chips away at that even more to get to finally 4.90. Because if we remember back in, what was it? May of 2021, he was one of the, I, with Kiramal, they were the first two guys that ushered us into the post Reza era mm -hmm. by, I think it was Kiramal that, first broke Reza's record in a qualification round. And then, what, hours later, Vedrik breaks it in the final round there at Salt Lake in 2021. Yeah, I can't remember the exact order, but both of them took turns breaking it. And, of course, at the end of the comp, it was Vedrik that comes away with the with the standing record, yeah. That's right. But since then, it's really been all Kiromal. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I, I looked at the list here. Uh, let's see. Um, so... In this past year, so just looking at 2022, Kiramal runs a, a 5.17, which was in Seoul uh, last season. Then he runs a 5.10 in Salt Lake City last year. Then a 5.09 in Vilar. Again, this is all Kiramal. And then mm -hmm. 5.04 again in Vilar. And then a 5 flat um, in, in Chamonix. So, so it's all been Kiramal. And you kind of feel a little bad for Vedrik kind of getting lost in the shuffle there because you know that he's, he's, I mean, he's right there with Kiramal, but just Kiramal has been the one that has kind of had the glory for the past I, season. I thought it was going to become this interesting dynamic where, uh, Vedrik was the guy that gets the medals. Kiramal is the guy that gets the records, right? At least that's how the story so far has kind of laid itself out. Right. Um, but then this totally throws a bone in that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or I think what I would, if you would, if we could go back in time and I could ask myself what I was thinking for the future back then in Salt Lake in 2021, when the two of them both broke that record kind of back to back, I was, I, th I was thinking, okay, this next season or the next two seasons, it's just going to be the two of them trading world records, but like Vedrik's going to get it. Then Kiramal's going to get it. Then Vedrik's going to get it. And then Kiramal. And that hasn't been the case at all. It's been all Kiramal. So it was just, it was, it was nice to see Vedrik get back in there, get the world record. And it goes without saying a 4.9 is blazing. I mean, when you just look at this and especially if you watch these runs with somebody that is not uh, a speed climber or not a, 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 even like a diehard fan of speed climbing, their jaw is just on the floor because mm -hmm. the smoothness and the quickness that 4.9 to get up the wall, it's, it's really something it's, it's a really impressive world record not to say it won't get broken very soon yeah. again which it might if this trend continues but 4.9 is uh, it's incredible stuff i should have checked the la sportiva website and see if the price of their speed shoe the 4.99 has just like been cut in half they're just like well this shoe's in the past 
It'll make yeah. it slower than the world record. Just get this thing off the shelves. Um, no, I was, uh, and and I think the the reason for all of these records being broken is is there is some dynamic where we I think we finally have athletes and countries challenging each other to push further. There have been incredible breakthroughs in the beta. I was watching just last night world record runs um, from like 2012 and 2013, where the barrier was six seconds. We were trying to break the six second barrier for the first time. And again, like, I mean, men's speed climbing on this wall kind of started around the eights and very quickly pushed through the sevens and ended up in the sixes. But the six second barrier was the first big barrier that everybody tried to break through. Um, so you're looking at like the Chishin Jongs and uh, Libor Hrozas and, and Daniel Bolderevs and even the Russian guys that were like still left over from um, from like classic speed. But just looking at the beta, you see how remarkable the difference is in which holds are being used, how they're being used. Of course, the, the line that the athletes are taking, where the dinos are, everything has changed so much in 10 years, obviously. But I would make the argument that most of that change within the 10 years was actually just in the last like four years, right? Like all of it has been, you know, loaded to one end with the arrival of the Olympics and and all of these countries taking it really, really seriously and innovating. Um, it's been nuts. And, and the one thing I'll say is like, I know there are creators making content about these innovations, but I feel like there is uh, an opportunity for, for a lot more well-produced content breaking down these key concepts and the timeline of it um, because it's had such a huge effect on this sport and uh, it's something that for me as somebody that you know has a really hard time analyzing movement like I always say um, I feel like even I don't have a good enough understanding of the changes that have actually been made and who you know innovated those changes and I think a lot of the credit of not just changing the beta, but showing us that there's the potential and the possibility if the beta is tweaked a little bit goes to Vedrik and Kiramal and their Indonesian squad and Indonesian coach. Because I remember when the the two of them, I can't remember which whether I was talking to Vedrik or whether I was talking to Kiramal, but it was after that Salt Lake City 2021 when, when they did break Reza's record. And I remember mm -hmm. after it, we were just kind of milling around and I asked them, like, oh, is this is this your limit? Was this your limit to get this world record, your physical performative limit? And so casually, without missing a beat, almost like dismissing my question as a joke, the response was, oh, like we can go way faster. I think that was the <laughs> phrase, like way faster. And that really opened my eyes to, oh, wow, like we haven't even scratched the surface of what's possible then if, if they were to be believed. And obviously they, they were now that we've come to find uh that that was just the beginning and yeah that with some some more practice and some tweaks on the beta in the lower section and now in the upper section that we're seeing really with uh particularly like the chinese squad and and sam watson and all that they're kind of tweaking the upper section which people really weren't at least uh publicly tweaking that much a, a few years ago now we're seeing that so it's really yeah it's really fun to pick apart where the changes and the improvements are happening segment by segment and again, I just I've said this before, but watching the center of gravity of this sport shift so far east is is wild. And part of that is geopolitical. But it is it is really nuts to see this sport that for like decades was the product of of Eastern European climbers, Russian, Soviet. Actually, I should just say Soviet because that'll incorporate most of them. Right. Um, uh, that's where it came from. Those are the climbers that, you know, chugged this sport along back when the World Cups would have like nine women in the field and 20 men, right? Like when it was, it was a small sport for a very long time. And then uh, only just recently have we seen it be embraced uh, uh, much more by uh, by a lot of other countries. So very cool developments. Um, Alexandra Miroslav, I don't have much else to say because the themes are similar, but breaking a record four times in a single comp is just absolutely baffling. Um, and you know, watching, watching her climb is so different compared to the men. Obviously I see her, you know, her body is being shifted kind of in one direction. The female beta is just different from, from the male beta in so many ways. Um, but the fact that she is the one single handedly breaking this record and has such a large margin, it seems between her and the next athletes, um, raises so many questions about 
what's going on 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 the women's side of speed climbing uh, because it seems just seems so unlikely that you have a veteran and again Alex like Alexandra's been competing for I'm pretty sure well over 10 years um I'd have to uh, look up when when she started but she is a veteran she's not like a young upstart shaking up the scene she's been around forever and is somehow still like at the cutting edge of this sport and absolutely dominating all these young kids wherever they come from. She is the one that's still leading all of them in every way. Um, and I think like is is going to go down as possibly at, at this point, the most legendary like speed climber on the female side. It's unbelievable. And the fact that she's breaking her own records, I think I said in my article so casually, right? That this one, it was like 6.37 down to 6.35, finally down to 6.25. No reason to think that she won't continue to chip away at that record as this season goes on. But I'm with you. I'd like to see, okay, how fast... We know how fast she can be when she is kind of the queen at the top of the pack. How fast can she be if she actually does have some someone really uh, pressuring her, right? Like, she she goes three, 6.35. Okay, what if there's somebody else that can run a 6.3 seven Mm -hmm. and if she's running 6.25 if that's the record i want to see her side by side with somebody that can run 6.28 or something right and let's really then see what happens when they push each other because i don't know if we've really seen that yet in the women's division for 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 speed and i i would imagine if we do see that at some point we're going to see that that world record time drop significantly right more than just a couple of those those hundredths but Mm -hmm. way more than that and i should i should say because somebody mentioned and i I, this isn't confirmed but i think the soul wall was apparently new for this season um so apparently the friction was really good um you know we talked about it last year it wasn't a particularly fast wall but it was also pretty damp last year if i remember right it was just a high humidity weekend and ended up raining as well during the bouldering round um but if it is, in fact, a new wall, that might have something to do with this. So when we get to Jakarta um, in just a few days, maybe we'll see something different. Maybe uh, maybe things will stagnate a bit. But, you know, uh, only time will tell. So I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to talk about for speed or if you wanted to uh, chat about the bouldering. Uh, well, just quick shout out to Emma Hunt and Sam Watson, who, by my uh, est- my calculations, set new American records there at this Soul World Cup. Sam Watson beats John Brosler's. American record with a, a new time of 5.02 and uh, Emma Hunt betters her own time. I think her previous time was 6.84 and she runs a 6.82. Uh, I was surprised. I didn't see any whatever social media, you know, promotion of this. So, so I was kind of like, wait, uh, they set these American records, right? Like I was waiting for some, some chatter about this. I didn't see it, but by my, like I said, by my calculations, by my own records in my notebook, uh, new American records in both the men's and women's division. Hmm. Cool. Good so, for them. Yeah. Yeah. Can't can't say the same about the Canadians. There's a lot of a lot of falls on the Canadian team side, unfortunately. But we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah. Well, bouldering. I think that the biggest story was, of course, the rain, and we saw a uh, a diminished event losing the finals round. So we just had qualifiers, uh, which for the men's was delayed by a day, and then semifinals ended up being the final. Um, uh, the final round of the competition, and those results stood. And of course, our winners, Mezdi, uh, Mezdi Shalk uh, over Tomoe Narasaki, and homeboy Jong Wan Chan back on the podium. On the women's side, uh, of course, Miho Nanaka makes a glorious return after a, a very long time away from, uh, from the gold medal place, um, followed up by two uh, recent uh, uh, consistent climbers, Oriane Berton and Brooke Rabatou, who was our winner last week. Uh, what did you think? Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I, it's a, a fat question, but uh, yeah. Well, where do you want to start? There's a, yeah, there's a lot. There's a there are a lot of angles that you have to look at this because it was this semifinals that be, that resulted in you know the final standings. Maybe we'll talk about that a little later, but. I, I suppose if to, to just throw out a, another headline, I suppose, right? We have our speed headlines and then and then maybe some bolder headlines. I think at this point, we've had Hachioji, we've had Seoul. So two events into this 2023 season, the women's bolder division is just a wild <laughs> uh, pick 'em 
free for all. I don't know what you want to call it. This the women's division is bonkers right now. I I, I guess to to ask a, a quiz question for you. Can you name off the top of your head a bouldering era for women that was more unpredictable, like going into you know the next comps than we are here at this point? I, the only like the only thing that comes to mind, and and I don't remember exactly the order of all this stuff, was is when we had that moment between the it was basically the transition period from Anna Stur, Akio Noguchi, Shauna Coxey into Yanya Garnbrett, where we saw Megan Muscarena, Megan Muscarenas win her first, Miho win her first, Petro win her first, right? And there was just that little bit of like you know what's going on in the scene, and then of course Yanya shows up and it's game over. So yeah, you have to go back like six or seven years. Yeah, and even then, like we said, it was like Megan won a couple of comps, Petra, but it like the that those eras were still defined or those seasons were still defined largely by a singular presence, right? Sure. Uh, let's look back at uh last season, of course it was Natalia. The season before that, uh, that was the Yanya era, which we might still be in, we don't know, right? To, I to think be so, determined. Yeah. <laughs> but and then and then you had Depending on the season, it was kind of like Akio, but then the season before that was Shauna, and then a the season before that was Akio. That's like we're like 2014 ish. Yeah, and, and again, you, that you know, you're talking like six years where it is the two of them, right? So, so yeah. it's consistent in that regard. It is, and and then you go back, of course, 2012 ish. That's on a store. I mean, you almost have to go back to the earlier 2000s, 06, 07, when you had uh, what was it like, like um. Uh, Juliette Danyon, I think, French. Basically, uh, basically, another transition period after Sandrine LeVay stops competing, and then all of a sudden you've got these different names that start to show yeah, up, Natalia like Gross, Olga Bibic and all that Olga stuff. Bibic, yeah, yeah, right. And but but again, that's 2006, 2007 ish. That's almost like pre IFSC. So <laughs> it is. So it is in the modern era or whatever we want to call this, the contemporary era. I think this is the most unpredictable that the women's Boulder Division has has been, and and. To go to the cast of characters, man, many of which you just mentioned, but you have Hannah Moyle. I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking here, if we have to predict who's going to mm -hmm. perform well in the comps to come, you have Hannah Moyle, who snagged a silver in Hachioji, but you know fell down the standings a little bit here in Seoul. Uh, you have, uh, of course, Natalia Grossman, who we haven't seen the results this season like we did last season, but you still have to think of her as a, as a, a potential for any competition for sure. this this year to get a gold medal or a podium. Then you have Brooke Rabatou, who I think heading into this season, I don't know if anybody would have picked her to be a consistent bouldering podium presence, maybe lead climbing and maybe a boulder here and there. But the fact that Brooke has just been an absolute crusher through these, through these first two world cups is, is phenomenal. Then you have Miho who is turn, turning back the clock yeah, yeah, after I absolutely, like absolutely started to like just consider her out of the game after after the last exactly. event, yeah. And then you have Orion, who's finding her form again. She's on the podium. Then you have Ayala Kareem, who proved has proved this season that last year in Salt Lake was not a fluke. She she is definitely a, an elite final fi consistent finalist. Mm -hmm. And then you have looming over it all, Yanya Garnbret as the biggest question mark of all. Which is to say, good luck trying to predict who's going to win the, the next bouldering World Cups. Hey, well, see, knows? that's that's the that's the thing is, you know, we we talk you talk about the periods before this, and often those like unstable periods may have lasted for like a season, a season and a half kind of thing. And again, they were usually involving the drop off of one athlete as we see them kind of trickle down the the ranks or the rise of another athlete, which you only know kind of in retrospect, but. Um, this has only been two events. So while I think you're right that these events are extremely hard to predict, I think that will change the moment we get to Prague because the conditions for this being hard to predict is the fast, is the fact that we lost our, our single S tier female boulderer, Yanya Garnbrett, and then we lost our A1 tier athlete, Natalia Grossman, for some reason, I don't know why, 
right? But when Natalia is not winning, then you're right. It is the crapshoot of the the one B climbers, the Orianne, the Brook, the you know all of uh, Miho, I guess, um, all of those climbers who are scrambling for bronze typically when Yanya and, and Natalia are in town. All of a sudden, with Yanya gone and Natalia not performing, I agree. Um, and Natalia, man, she's getting close to being listed as one of my losers because of how quickly this drop off has been. Somebody that you just say, yes, first place is yours. Uh, so long as Yanya doesn't show up um, and just hasn't been around. And so we'll, we'll talk about her maybe next week. I'm going to give her one more one more competition. Sorry, next week is in Salt Lake City. Um, I really want to see how Salt Lake City goes. But once we've done three comps, if uh, if she's not showing up in finals, I think I think it's uh, fair game to start talking about what's going on. Um, what happened, what's the difference. Um, but for now, yep. I'll, I'll give him a pass. But yeah, like I, I, I saying, think we'll hold off on Natalia also. We should acknowledge that she did apparently have a, a, a bad a neck, injury, neck injury, a whiplash yeah. neck injury during qualification. So we don't we don't really know how to place yeah. this. I'm giving that, I'm giving that a pass this week because of this. But after, the, after that, we got to talk about bigger uh, uh, bigger picture stuff because it, it shouldn't take you two events let alone three events to ramp back up to a form that you had quite dominantly in the past couple of years. It, it certainly makes you wonder, okay, what's missing? What happened? Well, um, it, yeah. Salt Lake is, t- history has shown her magic venue. So we'll see <laughs> what happens. For the happens. entire U.S. team. And yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's uh, I don't know what it, what's in the water in the States, but you guys have the home, the home team advantage like nobody else. Um, yeah, I, I, and a counterpoint to that is the men's side all of a sudden almost feels predictable. And again, the caveat is it's only been two comps. So, you know, maybe we should both settle down. But the fact that one guy has won two comps back to back, I'll be honest, that's a really uncommon thing to have happen, right? Uh, particularly in the last like 10 years, that's something that doesn't show up very often. You got I think it was Adam uh, in in 2021 managed to get the Maringen uh, Salt Lake City combo at the start of the season, but beyond that, I think you have to go back to 2017 to see Zhang Wan Chan, uh, and you realize, wow, winning two in a row puts you in really good historical company of like who has achieved that kind. It's like it's not a huge achievement. It's kind of you you want to almost say it's like more like luck because it happens so infrequently. As a comparison, fifty um, percent of women's World Cups are won by someone who also won the preceding or uh, following event, right? So about 50% of Women's World Cups are won by somebody that won the one before or after, which means you see a lot of consistency and a lot of repeats. And most of those are streaks, like Yanya having many events in a row, or Anna, or Akio, right? So there's a lot more uh, of, a, of a through line in your typical women's bouldering event. Whereas on the men's side, it's only 25%. And most of those were in a particular era when Dmitry Sharafudinov and Kilian Fischuber we're going, you know, head to head back in like what, 2012 or 2011, 2013. So for the men's side, it's extremely rare to have repeat winners. Um, it's also just rare to win two World Cups in a single season anymore, which is crazy to say, but it almost puts Mejdi at this point as like the, the absolute favorite by quite a lot to win the 2023 bouldering world cup just because he's managed to lock down two wins already so long as he shows up and puts up like a, a, a you know a, a passing effort he should do fine which is wild to say and we're only like we're two weeks into the season literally two weeks into the season i had to do a double take when he won this in Seoul because I was like, wait, he won in Hachioji. And then I, I, I was like, yeah. And then I had checked. And I was like, wait, but I, like, are we sure he won in Hachioji? Because mm-hmm. it was almost, we're just, I'm just not used to uh, having a guy win back to back world cups. And I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but let's talk about streaks. Yeah, uh, let's do it. I'm in, ready. In a lot of ways. I think these upcoming, th- this upcoming Salt Lake city world cup is, among the most intriguing or exciting or important men's world cup, Boulder world cup that we've had in a long time, because if we go back to 2019, Yanya's performance that season, if people remember watching that season in real time, it was right around her third win that we started thinking, Oh, well now wait a minute, right? Like she she could maybe sort of, Mm. go the whole season. <laughs> nobody nobody right? wanted like, to it was, say it, but yeah. Yeah, and and that chatter didn't really heat up until what? The third the third or fourth 
comp of that season. So I, for me, it was after winning the fourth. It was like, wait a second, what's what's going on here? Yeah, okay, yeah. Going so into what what would it have been that year? Munich and Vale were the last two. Am I remembering that right? Munich was the one where Mia hurt her knee and still climbed, and then yeah, Vale was the finisher because the yep. yeah everybody remembers that yeah. Yeah, and so okay, so maybe Salt Lake City, maybe the one after Salt Lake City. If yeah, Salt Lake when, Salt Lake wasn't little... on the calendar in 2019, but uh, oh, but yeah, sorry, you mean but this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, but I, we're getting to that point where these these competitions for the men carry a little more weight in uh, for Medjdi, right? Because he's maybe putting something together here that mm-hmm. would be truly, truly historic. We will see, and we don't want to put too much pressure on him, uh, but uh, well, let me, but it's going to be fun. Let me just mention how low the bar is for streaks in, in men's bouldering, right? So I just mentioned that winning two in a row is rare, right? Two in a row is rare. Three in a row is basically unheard of. It's only been done by one person. It is Dmitry Sherafudinov. He did it twice, which is pretty remarkable. So once in 2007 and once at the end of 2012 and the first event of 2013. All right. So Dmitry Sharifudinov has won three in a row twice, and he's the only person to ever do that in men's bouldering. Um, No one has ever won four in a row or more ever. So if Mejdi manages to win Salt Lake City in in a couple of weeks. That puts him in remarkable company. Uh, you know, it's a it's a um, uh, uh, what's the what's the phrase I'm thinking of a team of two or whatever. Anyway, it's a it's a very small club for people that have won three in a row. And then you add one more and it's over. You've won the most World Cups in a row in history for men in the you know 25 year history of of World Cup bouldering. Um, so that's how low the bar is, right? For Jan Nish, you needed to sweep an entire season. So it's a, it's a really different set of conditions. And I'm not going to ask you to make a prediction, but I will say, speaking of Natalia performing well in Salt Lake City, Mejdi has a history of performing pretty well in Salt Lake City as well. Remember that iconic moment when he was so hyped and he threw his chalk bag down? It's one of the greatest uh, hype moments mm. of the past well, several I, seasons I, i'm happy to make a prediction in this case because meji looks just honestly so much better than everybody else right now and aside from we've managed to see some consistency between all the rounds who else is his consistent challenger at this point right like yoshiyuki fell off a cliff you know a relative cliff still still making semifinals and everything but that's your world cup champion from last year nowhere to be seen all of the japanese guys are seeing inconsistency kokoro I don't know how long he'll be out to make sure his elbow is okay. Uh, uh, if, for, if people didn't know, he made semifinals, but he chose not to compete in semifinals this weekend because of an elbow injury uh, supposedly sustained in a fall in qualifiers. So that's one of your three Japanese men straight up out, while the other two have been very inconsistent. The rest of the field is kind of like up and comers or... If some of the legends actually come back, you know, if Andre comes back for World Cup, you know, Jakob, we saw this weekend, if I'm right, didn't make semifinals, just missed the cut. So who who is it that's going to compete with Mejdi? I think the eye test says he's in great form. He's also charismatic enough that I want to make predictions for him. Like, I want this to happen. So I'm I'm totally cool saying, yeah, Mejdi wins Salt Lake City. We'll see what happens. This goes back to something I said on the last episode of The Debrief, too, which is where are the American men? Uh, For real. What what's going on here? I I Sean Bailey, all credit to him, makes a semifinals. But having Sean that Bailey that can't be good enough for you guys. Not in an Olympic qualification year. Like that's a problem. It's it's a kind of a throwback. I texted you this. I said having Sean Bailey be the only American man in the semifinals sound. It feels very 2016 ish, right? <laughs> if anybody remembers watching competitions back then, when Sean was the only man who would make it into semis. It, and I think huge strides have been made performatively and in results for the American squad since then, obviously. And so, yeah, you would think that maybe Sean Bailey or uh, Colin Duffy or, or who knows, Nathaniel well, Coleman, there's all sorts of guys. Honestly, you would expect Colin, Duff, be up there Colin Duffy with- is the one I'm I'm confused about. Now, I understand he is an absolute favorite to be an Olympian this go round, um, you know, just, you know, you look at his performance over the last couple of years, he's incredibly talented in both bouldering and lead. I would, at the start of this year, I would have expected him to get his 
Olympic berth, probably at the World Championships in the very first step, based on what we saw from last year. Um, now, again, the the caveat for this season is, well, you know, I've got an excuse because I'm trying to peak at a different time, and it doesn't matter how I'm performing right now, so long as I perform at World Championships time to time it all for the for the qualification pathway. But if you show up for these comps, I don't really like. I, are athletes really able to throttle how much effort they're putting into this stuff? And you know, is your form today going to be so different from from you know a few months from now that you're getting the kind of like non semifinals results? I don't know. That might be something for for coaches to to maybe respond in the comments if you think that's a reasonable progression. That if Colin's performing like this, can he actually reach the peak that he needs in August to get that? to get that Olympic berth that he's aiming for. I don't know. Yeah. And, and I, I don't want to go over everything I said last, last episode, but it's the, the same thing holds here, which I, I'm still just kind of wondering what's up with the U S men's squad. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Completely. Um, let's talk about the women's side a little bit. Um, do you, do you want to get, you know, just, just cause it, you know, I, I still think I have the upper hand on this, but do you want to talk about Annie Sanders now? Can we leave it to later? Can we just say congratulations and then just forget about it again? Well, I, I, was she watching our show? Was she listening to our, hearing our call? I guarantee because... you she was not watching this show. There's simply <laughs> no way. Well, it was really cool though, because we have said on this show before that the, American women's squad it's a little bit deceptive because it's it seems like they are uh, a major power player as a squad but in in fact it's really it has always been kind of a select couple of athletes right it, it really Brooke and Natalia yes. and this season it's been it's been mainly Brooke so far and so and and then there's this big gap and then there's a lot of other um American women in sort of the below, like in the lower quadrant, don't usually make semifinals, right, and and whatnot. And we've kind of been waiting. Okay, let's have some of those women that are lower down start pushing up into the semifinals and pushing into the finals. You guys have your competitive squad, and then you've got your commentary squad, the uh, <laughs> the climbers that show up because they're going to commentate semifinals with Matt Groom. Yeah. Well, and Annie Sanders is she's she was. 37th in Hachioji, which I know some people might have looked at that and said, oh, it's a little surprising. It's a little bit disappointing. I didn't think that. I just thought this is her first ever adult World mm-hmm. Cup, right? Like it, it's to be expected that she's just kind of getting her feet wet in there. And I knew and I think everybody knew she was m- more uh, capable of, of placing much higher here in this competition in Seoul. She makes a, I guess, I don't know what you'd call would have made a finals if there had been a finals, but yeah. as a result becomes top six. She got fifth place here and seems to just, I mean, going from 37th to fifth, that's a huge jump. How much farther can she jump? I guess let's make a prediction here. Do we see Annie Sanders on a podium this year? I I'll say yes. I think Annie Sanders makes it on a, on a podium. Are you saying like just bouldering or what what are we talking? I'm just trying to define the limits. Yeah, just podium. Yeah, that's a that's a hard one because like I can see that happening. Um I I don't think she is a consistent finalist at this point. But once you make a final, especially if it happens at Salt Lake City where there's the just like the stars and stripes buff for some reason and Yanya's not there, and I honestly don't expect Natalia Grossman to have some magical resurgence. It does seem you know, we'll talk about it more later, but it does seem like there is some some issue. Um, uh, I don't know. It's possible, but I wouldn't bet on it. Actually, I would say I would say maybe she can get one more final. But I think once once Yanya's back and that that top six tightens up, I say no. I I think I see Yanya as a uh, her performative level. I I, I don't know how to. Analyze do you do you her. think it's a question mark right now? Because I Absolutely. I I feel the opposite. I am extremely confident that the moment she returns, she starts taking gold again. Her <laughs> and last... I don't I don't know why you would think otherwise. I think that's my interesting question because we have no reason to doubt her aside from we haven't seen her. Because her last World Cup win was <laughs> yeah. Meiringen 
2022 and yeah. there's been a whole for all intents and purposes there has been a an entire season boulder season since then the the, the five comps that she didn't participate in in 2022 and now there's going to be half of this whole season by the time she returns a season and a half of not having that elite level world cup competition that's a a season and a half that's huge that's uh, we've I seen agree. so much yeah. can change in in a we we've seen how much can change in the women's division here from comp to comp let alone from season to season let alone from a season and a half so i'm not saying i'm not I'm, of course i'm not ready to write off yanya at all mm -hmm. i'm saying i have no idea it's a huge question mark right. and um <laughs> we'll we'll see but i think anybody that is is certain that she is absolutely going to come back and start crushing at the same level she was what two years ago i i, I would say what are you, you you have to be basing that on just, just <laughs> what we're basing it off of everybody talking about her as the greatest you know climber ever and, and we've seen in her bouldering that since 2019 she's been a completely dominant force i think she is uh man i'm red in the face i feel like i'm yawning too much sorry um you know, she is ramping up to the Olympics. We know that she takes it very seriously. She might be the most professional, most driven athlete in the scene right now. Um, and, <laughs> you know, she's she's working with the root setters, apparently, according to that flat hold video, trying to getting all the early beta before before the boulders are even set on the wall. I think she's, you know, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think she's really taken a break. I think your argument is best made regarding ring rust the idea that like you haven't been in the game and so your game sense your ability to compete might be a little bit off i think that's fair but i don't think her actual physical you know performance is going to take any drop off barring the foot thing that may have caused you know an obstacle for a bit but the fact that she's taking a serious recovery and is still training and was involved in that training camp we saw that video come out from uh that gym in austria blockhouse um, you know, she's there with the German team and the Slovenian team. Um, I don't think she's taken a break. She has from being at the comps, but my expectation is she gets right back into the groove the moment she's back. That's that's what I think personally. But yeah. we'll see. We will see. But yeah, let's yeah. talk about Miho finally. Um, Miho, unlike Annie Sanders, somebody who in her first World Cup did actually do really well. Just I don't know why I have to drag these comparisons out. <laughs> I the whole point is I I just don't want to like put too much pressure on a kid basically, and I don't think winning nationals is like a good enough reason to think somebody's going to come finals in a World Cup. That's my I have nothing against Annie Sanders. I just have a lot against the hype. I guess. Yeah, um, and ma make no mistake. I I don't want to add to that. I I I think it's perfectly fine if she continues this season just placing thirty seventh, thirty fifth, thirty. Yeah. I think that's just valuable experience. Get some mileage. I, yeah, anything anything that she does this year in terms of making a semis, making a finals, or beyond. I, I consider it kind of a bonus because mm -hmm. she's only 15 years old. I, it's a long competitive career ahead of her. Yeah, I certainly yeah. don't want to act like we're adding to this this pressure at all. Um, yeah. But I will say any competitor who is garnering at age 15 comparisons in one way or, to no, or, or another to Miho Nanaka, I think anybody would be happy for those. That's a good That's a good barometer to be measured against. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to bring it up because I, if I remember right, one of your first pieces writing about competitive climbing was actually about Miho Nanaka. Um, back in 2014, her, I think that was actually her debut bouldering year. And I think she had competed in like maybe lead world cups before that, or just youth stuff. But shows up in the bouldering scene in 2014, and I think your the article you wrote at the time is a highlight or is a is a profile of I think a 17 year old climber at the time showing a ton of promise, and that promise was justified because in her first season she made a bunch of finals and ended the season with a silver medal, right? And this is in the in the deep deep era of Akio versus Anna, so the gold medals are are basically monopolized or duopolized between those two climbers. Um, so the fact that you managed to snag a silver is, is impressive by itself, but that was the, you know, the era of the famous five where the final was a consistent crew of incredibly strong women and she broke into that. Um, and then you zoom out and you look at her entire career since then and you say, wow, this really didn't go the way that we would have expected for somebody that was maybe considered the heir to the Akio Noguchi 
throne as being your top Japanese woman. Um, and, and because of that being one of the top climbers in the world. Um, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts before I kind of like rail off the timeline of her career, but like how, uh, you know, how is Akio's or pardon me, see, that's the, <laughs> that's the, you're just living in the shadow. Um, how is Miho's career like played out? Is it the way that you expected back when you wrote that? She is definitely a classic case of an athlete that just had the misfortune of getting derailed by injuries. Mm -hmm. that, and and I think for forever, there is going to be this question of Miho, the what if. What if she had not had those bad shoulder injuries that took her out of so many World Cups? I, I think in a lot of ways, making a podium at the Olympics uh, – kind of saves her her career in terms of when you look back on it because it feels like okay at least she's been such a charismatic presence such a popular presence and and so good she was derailed by these injuries but at least she gets that olympic uh shine to her name and she will have that forever because think if miho didn't have that olympic podium and that olympic hype and all of that i think i think we would be thinking of her career as being even more of a misfortune, right? Because of those injuries and everything like that. I, but going back to your question, I, yeah, I just think there's a what if with Miho. I, I guess in hindsight, it's it was never really fair to compare her to Akio because I, it, their climbing styles are so different. Uh, and Akio, I don't think ever had to deal. I never had to deal with an injury that w that took her out of competition the way that Miho's shoulder injury did and whatnot. So, two very different personalities, two very different careers. Yes, they are both on the Japanese squad. Yes, I think there was this sort of mentor mentee thing that that they had going on for a long time with with Akio being the veteran and and kind of guiding a young Miho through the kind of through the beginnings of being on the adult circuit and stuff. But well, even just the natural narrative of, you know, Akio, by the time she's in her mid twenties, you have Miho coming up and you just say, well, that's probably the next, you know, that's the next big name, right? Whenever Akio decides to call it, Miho's now on top and, and, you know, hope she performs the same way Akio does. Yeah. Just to branch off your point about the, um, uh, the injury, I have to double take my results because Miho didn't make a World Cup or World Championship podium for basically three and a half years, right? She was not on any podium in 2019. There were no comps in 2020 that matter. Again, 2021, no podiums. It wasn't until just last season that she managed to return to the podium with a bronze and a silver in Salt Lake City. So for three years, she was basically a non-factor. The fact that she managed to get that Olympic podium is remarkable and, and looks so incongruous to her results everywhere else. Um, but going before that, because that's the, the second component of the nature of her career is that climbers like Akio lasted way longer than you would have expected. And then of course, Yanya Garnbrett comes up and actually Shauna Coxie is a factor in this too. But yeah, this, this being Miho's only fourth gold medal in 10 years, when she has been at least a star climber, the entire duration of those 10 years is not what I would have expected at the start of her career. Um, you've just got other people kind of crowding the top. There's the famous 2018 when Miho won the first event and then earned silver at every other World Cup for the rest of that season. Um, it, that season kind of tells the story of like you get you get a win, but the rest of the time it's dominated by whoever the superstar of that era is. And so combine that with the injuries and COVID and focus on the Olympics and all that stuff it's it's one of the most underwhelming gold medal collections although still an impressive medal collection if you count the silvers and bronzes but for somebody that is is ending their well will end their career at least as a superstar of the sport you're like wow you haven't earned much so far and it's not you know it's not because you're not strong it's not because you're a good boulder you know it's pretty wild i, I think she has done to her credit in large part a, a great job of staying in the public consciousness and and being a star with ancillary elements to the results themselves or, mm -hmm. to, or to the gold medals themselves we should say first and foremost the olympics which which we said also let's acknowledge she has a, a huge social media following and mm -hmm. she's and i think that that's helped a lot i think she's a, a fairly big um 
name in Japan for uh, for just I think she has all sorts of sponsors and stuff like that. And and also let's acknowledge her her friendship with with Sean Bailey and the fact that she's traveled over to the U.S. and trained at the U.S. Training Center and stuff. And so I think that has helped her kind Team of Team USA, become, baby. I th- well, I think yeah. that that's helped her kind of stay on the radar of American fans in and a I, lot of ways. And too. I should also just say, like, she's not getting gold medals and she wasn't making podiums over the last couple of years. She was still in finals, right? She was still somebody that everybody was seeing on the broadcast. It's just the results probably aren't what she expected or aren't what we hoped for, for, for who we thought was the second coming of the greatest Japanese boulderer ever. Right. It just didn't work out that way. Yeah. And I, I guess if anything on a bright, on the, on the bright side, the fact that she won here in Seoul proves that uh, maybe there's going to be a second chapter to her career, right? Maybe she can snag a couple more gold medals and, and kind of add to that medal count. So there is not such a what if to her career, uh, at least not as big as there is now, because Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a fair question to ask when you're looking at, at her, all the woes that she's had amid all the results and, and everything. Yeah. And I like uh, the, the caveat that makes me not necessarily hopeful uh, for, for future medals is the fact that the two dominant forces of today were either not there or not in form. So if those factors return, I think Mio is back to chasing bronzes, frankly. Um, but it, it certainly just felt nice. I guess I guess what I actually wanted to say from the top of this was it was very cool to see someone win who obviously values the win and knows that just because you have a strong start to your career, there's absolutely no guarantees that you're going to see any kind of success. And I think this is probably the win that means the most to her after having, you know, now a, a 10 year career at the adult level um, and going through so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure this is one of the sweetest gold medal wins that's that's ever existed in uh, in comp climbing for sure. Yeah, very well said. I agree. And now let me rain on the parade a little bit. All right. <laughs> because... Uh, 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 we have to, I mean, Miho won this event fair and square, but I come away from this event feeling very uh, unsatisfied with the results. I feel like the results weren't definitive. Of course, we're talking about the weather. We're talking about the semifinals becoming resulting in the final round standards. Here's why I crunched some numbers. So going back to 2018, and this is focused only on the women's bouldering division, but only 60%, 66% of the time has the woman who was leading in semis gone on to win the final round. So that's 2018, 2019, 2020. So that season mm-hmm. wasn't there. 2021, 2022 in those seasons, 66% of the time. Is that a majority? Yeah. Is it an overwhelming majority? No. So definitely no guarantee that Miho would have won in the finals had this resulted in a normal final round. Um, I, I would also be very curious to, to see what that number is if you remove Yanya from, so like any event where Yanya is involved, just take her out because Yanya, of course, notoriously dominant across most of the rounds that she competes in. So for like, for just the average climber, like a Brooke or a Miho, you kind of wonder if, uh, if the consistency between semis and finals is different. Yeah. And so that all played into me coming away from this on the one hand, being very happy for Miho. Like I said, she won fair and square, but also thinking, well, if it wasn't for the weirdness of this event and the weather and the rescheduling and the postponement, and finally the, the semifinals being the end all be all, I don't know if Mio would have really won the gold medal. Um, Statistically speaking, probably, but not, not absolutely. And 66%, like I said. So um, that's me. (laughs) That's my counterpoint to all this praise that we have been, been giving Mio. That's a, that's like extremely fair. Like, obviously, obviously it's a fair win because it, every, the same rules applied to everybody. It's just how it goes. And, uh, and interesting, it seems like the, the boulders were actually the boulders intended for finals. So we got to see them on legit boulders. But to that point, I thought it actually functioned very well as a semifinal, like particularly for the women's side, talk about a dream semifinal where everything is really, really hard 
Tops are few and far between. You you can't fake it uh, to get a top on these things. But also we got to see tops for every single boulder on the women's side, just split across different climbers. So, um, you know, I think what first place came away with two tops. Am I right? Miho got two tops and it was down for a couple athletes with the same results, just a mix of different boulders. And then the people with one tops like Annie Sanders, you know, had a boulder that some of the other climbers didn't. I thought, I thought it was a, a really well set round, even though it's a little bit unintentional and not quite the plan uh, for what we understand. Uh, you know, whatever the actual semifinal boulders were, are lost to time at this point. Uh, maybe write them down, save them for Seoul next year or something. But uh, I thought I thought it functioned really well. And for a semifinal round, I thought it was really good. And actually, just as a change of pace, I kind of enjoyed it as a final. It was a fun way to watch, partially because we only had to watch a single round of climbing to see all of the uh, men and women rather than having to split it into two. And of course, as a semifinals, there's basically no downtime. So there was always something to watch, even if we occasionally missed some things. But uh, like at this point, I'm just so desensitized to that. Like I don't, I don't have it in me to complain about missing somebody's top anymore. Like I'm just, it's, uh, you just live with it for long enough. Um, so I really enjoyed myself. And I, I, I think, uh, I think the setters and the athletes are probably very happy with the quality of the climbing and the quality of the results. I thought it was a really strong comp. It was a strong comp. All credit to the IFSC and the organizers for adapting to the weather, which they couldn't control, outdoor venue. If you, th This was the second year in a row where the weather has wreaked havoc on the proceedings. If people remember last year in Seoul, there wasn't a full-on uh, revamping of the final like there was here, but there was a rain delay on the live stream and people were just waiting around for a long time. And then here things obviously got all switched around in a really big way. If you were in control of this event, speaking of next season, do you continue to have this event in Seoul in this beautiful outdoor park? Or are you saying, Hey, we got, this is two seasons in a row rain. It's not really the monsoon season in Korea. That doesn't usually start till June, but still, I mean, history tells us it's, it's a very rainy time. Do you move it indoors at this point? I, I don't think rain is enough of a disincentive for event organizers to consider choosing a more expensive venue. And I think that's really just the nature of it. I think rain is rare enough that it's not really a, a, uh, a factor that people consider outside of, of course, you know, parts of the world and times of year where rain is like expected you know right where it's literally that's that's what the forecast calls for 30 days in a row or whatever it's like in in, in parts of asia and maybe other parts of the world um i think i think it's just a practicality right the event organizer who, who is not receiving funding from from the ifsc to you know run the event and find the venue and build the walls and stuff you got to find a place that is ideally cheap that can fit the walls that you're putting in so again you're trying to find a venue for a speed wall guys which is rare there's not a lot of like open buildings that can fit a speed wall that are inexpensive in the same way that renting a municipal park might be right it's a lot cheaper to do that kind of thing um, so i think the facility requirements with the height and then also the crowd um it's just easier to go outside. And I think that's I think that's where most event organizers start their search just because of the financial implications and the availability, right? You're it's a lot easier to find a parking like you were there at Salt Lake City the first year of it, 2021. Were you in a parking lot surrounded by like junkyards? Like when you when I look at that area on Google Maps, I'm like, holy crap, like this is the the wrong end of town. It seems like an old industrial, like, you know, light industrial zone. Not a nice place to be, but it's where you can put down a tent and get some crowds in the lot. And uh, and that's what works. And I think that's what the event organizers or EOs are are kind of pushed towards because it's cheaper and more readily available. Yeah, I guess I'd like to know if you're are, do you, are you, what takes precedence here? Are you looking at let's go to this city and then let's find a good place to hold this comp? Or do you look around and say, hey, this place would be a really good place to hold a comp. Let's pursue this city. Let's let's talk to the, the federation in this country and this city and see how we can make this happen. Because well, I think like as far and I could be wrong, but as, as far as I understand to run a World Cup, you have to bid for the World Cup. So it's not and I'm sure sometimes the IFSC probably leans on certain 
countries and federations like to run an event for them when when times are lean and they need particular spots or if they would really like an event at a particular place maybe the ifsc put some pressure but otherwise it is the national federation offering up a venue and trying to secure a world cup in their home country right so the onus falls on them to to find a place that they can make work so maybe korea is thinking yeah we want to keep this world cup and maybe the ifsc is bothered about rain two years in a row but i'm guessing they're not because i i they know that you can't predict for rain they know that this was a good tent and they've got a good setup that's like rain proof for a lot of different types of precipitation this day just happened to be a bit too much, right? Like you can run a boulder comp in light rain. That's not the end of the world. It can be a bit of an annoyance, but it's not going to stop the competition. This was one of the rare cases where it did. Um, so I don't think this is bad enough yet. I think all of us agree that it would be better if World Cups always ran on time and weather didn't stop them from running. But for a lot of World Cup stops, the cost of holding it indoors would take them off the calendar completely. So I think that's just the unfortunate trade-off from what I understand. Yeah, well said. And I do, I, having been to indoor uh, convention center type places that that to watch bouldering events in South Korea, I, I know that there are plenty of convention centers that have worked and would work for these kinds of, for a Boulder World Cup. Now, I think the big thing is the speed wall, to your point. I, I don't know about the the ceiling height and all of that of these places being able to fit a homologated speed wall in there. So that would, that would be tricky. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, two seasons in a row. I don't know. Maybe okay. Let's maybe try it one more season, and then three strikes and you're out for for the 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 uh, waterfall park here. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe you never know. Uh, we'll yeah. just have to see what happens. Um, uh, World Championships 2025 is in Seoul. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that is the end of it for Korea. Um, I think it's still a requirement if you want to host a world championships in your country, you have to have hosted a world cup the seasons previous, like when you're applying to do a world championship, you have to have proven that your federation can can run an event basically seems to be the the, uh, the spirit of that requirement. So I'm willing to bet after the 2025 world championships, they maybe reconsider and say, you know, that was a fun run. We got like four or five years out of Seoul and let's call it handed off to somebody else. Like if they're having issues with supporting it financially, I really don't know anything about the the nature of uh, you know, the Korean Federation's financial situation. I look at the number of people at this event and it's clearly not a ticket draw. I don't know what the sponsorship landscape is out there. I don't know how much support they got from local governments. But once you get that world championship, maybe you say, yeah, we did it. We, you know, Korea hosted a world championship for the first time. Let's uh, let's call it there. Take a break. So who knows? Well, if we have if we have sunny weather now until 2025, then the the percentage of <laughs> rain marred competitions in Seoul will be 50 percent so <laughs> we'll see not the can... worst <laughs> not the worst not the not worst, the worst. I mean, it's not quite Briançon levels of, of disaster although uh, recent years haven't been too bad but yeah remember was it last year Innsbruck was like each day was like thunderstorms it was yeah like I mean some some events suck even though the walls are amazing the venue's amazing all that stuff and you're just like damn this is you know bad luck but it's just how it goes um, yeah, I wanted to, my, my loser, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek cause I don't have much to say about it. I was really disappointed on behalf of the Canadian speed climbing team. Cause they went all the way to Korea to have a lot of falls, um, and a lot of runs that I know they weren't happy with. Um, I think the only like notable run would have been Michael Finn Henry, who did manage to put something down in the five seconds, but for everybody else, I think, uh, I think it was a, um, an unsatisfying event for them. I don't expect the Canadians to make finals. It's very pleasant when one of them makes the round of 16. That's always a great surprise. And I think that's about where they all are right now in terms of the times they set. Um, but it was, uh, I think, I think all of them are disappointed. I'm very curious to see how they regroup if they make a strategic change to, to their, their training, their preparation, their headspace. But I think, I think Seoul was a failure for the Canadian speed team and I'm glad that it happened early and hopefully they fix it for the upcoming events because uh, I don't think any of them got to actually show their best. It was uh, really unfortunate given how big that trip was. Uh, that's a long plane flight to go yeah. just for a, a couple split seconds. Uh, yeah, I agree. I was really curious. So I looked up the Canadian 
national speed records. And so here, here's here's what I found. So you're gonna be surprised Yip, who our female world record or uh, record Al- holder is. Yeah, Alana Yip holds the women's record seven point nine nine. So almost almost eight seconds, just a just a hair under eight seconds. And it was set at the Olympics, twenty twenty one. Uh, Ethan Flynn pitcher holds the men's record at 5.66. And it seems to me that those records are ripe for the pickings for someone else to, uh, in the Canadian squad to, to break those records. Because think about Alana's 7.99. Uh, compare that, like I said, almost eight flat. Compare that to the U.S. record, which is 6.82, which is... A, a, a second faster, right? You'd, you'd expect that the Canadian record and the American record would be much closer than that. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see somebody, especially a speed specialist, maybe uh, snag that record, a new Canadian women's record at some point. Um, because, it, again, if the American record is 6.8, I would think Canada would be, if not the same or better, at least... Okay, 6.8 is the U.S. Well, the, the comparison I make is that it's almost two seconds behind the world record, which is kind of shocking. Um, now, the, the the one thing is most of the, the speed stuff that we've been able to be proud of over the last couple of years is on the men's side. The women's side is a pretty small crew of, of young women. Erica Velev is, is the kind of one notable climber um, who I expect will break that record eventually. Um, maybe this season, maybe next season, but you have to, you know, you have to get off the ground, right? And then you have to not fall part way up. Which I, I like. I'm not telling them anything they don't know, and I, I'm not making fun of them. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed on their behalf. It was really too bad. But yeah, I think you're right. Those the women's record is is absolutely right for the picking. And then look at the the American men's record is is like we said at the top of this show, five point zero two, so really close to five flat, and the uh, the Canadian record is 5.66. So I would think that if the, I would, ex- like I said, I would expect the Canadian record to be as good as or better than the American record. And if it's not, if the Canadian record's slower than the American record of 5.02, I would think it would be more like 5.2, 5.1, right? Mm. It would be really close. Yeah, I think I think the, I think the men's record is is probably about where it should be. Just like just like you know, you I think most people would have to look up the names of Canada's best speed climber, right? Like if you're just a casual viewer, you would have to research that. Whereas if you're just a a, a World Cup watcher and you watch the finals, you know who Sam Watson is, you know who John Browser is, you might know who Noah Bracci is, right? Those those are names that you see in finals pretty regularly. Sam now becoming very consistent. John browser has been around forever, it seems, at this point, um, making finals when he can. Noah is also kind of a newer name. But for the men, again, it is it is very rare making finals, and I don't, th- I can't think of any of them getting past the round of 16. So it is it is just a smaller team, and I think it's a, a reasonable relationship between Canada and the States. You guys have always been in stronger, more bigger teams, all that kind of stuff. So I think the men's is about right, but the women's one, it's time to time to trim it. Yeah, and I don't say that to take anything away from Ethan Flynn Pitcher. If anything, I, I what I'm saying I think it's just is I, Ethan, I would expect him Ethan to go... Pitcher. Just Ethan Pitcher. I think you're mixing up Michael Finn Henry's oh, name. Oh, I'm sorry. With yeah, Pitcher, um, I would expect him to be to continue to chip away at that record and and get it down a little a little more because he's a really mm. young competitor, if I remember correctly. And, yeah. Uh, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, he false starts. So, uh, so you know, gotta gotta hate that one. Fortunately, it was his second run, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so that was my that was my big disappointment from the comp. Aside from the rain, was there like was there anything else that for yours? Like, I mean, we've talked about you know the the U.S. men's team, so maybe you're you're all out of losers at this point. But I don't know if there was anything else. Yeah. Well, my I guess mine is a little bit tongue in cheek too. We've we've been big champions of Che So here, but we, I I should acknowledge for this loser category, Che So was 29th here in Seoul. Uh, after being 14th at last week in Hachioji, uh, 29th is technically her lowest Boulder World Cup result ever. I think she was 37th in the Boulder really? at the World Championship. But World Cup wise, again, she doesn't do every Boulder World Cup, but um, but for hmm. World Cups, this was her lowest place. So I guess just like statistically speaking, we have to put her in this category. I don't want to make a big deal out of it, though, because I think, who knows, maybe it was some hometown hometown nerves or whatever. There's no reason to think that, that she won't bounce back from this. 
uh, we're big fans of Cheon, but yeah, I'll, this I'll be honest. Look- if if I had to like just imagine, because I I have not looked at her bouldering stats, I definitely would have thought she would have had some lower bouldering performances. Because I I think of her as a lead climber that has some good days bouldering, and good days is usually just semifinals, right? Um, so uh, that's a that's a surprise to me, actually. Um, wow, yeah, that's which, that's interesting. Which is to say, it, I. You have to absolutely consider Cheyun to be an Olympic 2024, uh, you know, sure. favorite at this point because she has been really pretty high in bouldering, despite the fact that she is a lead specialist. Mm-hmm. She's still able to do consistently pretty well in the boulder division, uh, the boulder discipline, but not not so much at this one. So we'll put her in this category. Let me uh, let me ask you one last question before we before we wrap this up, and it is about I'm Mori. Um, in 2019, I Mori managed to get a bouldering bronze. I think that was her only bouldering medal so far, if I remember right, um, in a World Cup. Um, and since then, last year in particular, we got to see her as this lead climbing phenom, which doesn't tell us anything about bouldering. We just know genuinely a talented climber. And then, of course, one in Morioka, um, mostly off the strength of her lead climbing, but still you know, good bouldering performances in that weird oddball combined World Cup. Um, Are you disappointed so far? Because we haven't really talked about her name. And I think part of that is I do think of her as a lead specialist, but also it was just two World Cups this year. And this is kind of the season where I'm going to actually find out who Aimori is, right? Not just two amazing World Cups at the end of season. Now it's like, okay, who are you really? Um, Any any thoughts on Aimori so far? I don't know if I'm I don't know if disappointed would be the right word. I, I would say I'm not surprised because this is what I have thought all along and we've had great conversations with all the, the good people in the Discord about this, which is the the dynamic bouldering moves are her kryptonite. She try she actively tries to avoid doing moves dynamically when it is very clear that that is the beta. That is the intended way to do it. That is the way that you're most likely to have success on this boulder. She does not do that. And we have said in the Discord, until she gets more comfortable doing dynamic moves, the boulder, the bouldering division, the bouldering discipline is just going to be a huge challenge for her. And I think the moments that we've seen her do well in bouldering are the rare occasions, the anomalies where she is able to, to, either she's able to figure out how to do something statically that otherwise was dynamic or it's just a not a particularly dynamic set of boulders and it's just kind of like luck of the draw and she's able to do it. I I continue to say the same thing. She needs to get more comfortable at doing these dynamic moves if she wants to have success, uh, more success in the boulder discipline, which is to say if she wants to have uh, success in the, in the combined discipline because I think this season has showed us that these boulders are really, really dynamic, really parkour yes. influenced more. I would argue more than we've ever seen in a boulder season. This season, we're just seeing all of this athletic, uh, leapy, jumpy, twisty coordination, paddle, all this stuff. And I, I think she's capable of of getting comfortable on these moves. She's, she's young enough and talented enough that I think she can do it. But I really think she needs a, some coaching that can really just – give her some some confidence and some poise and some acumen to do these acrobatic things because she just it it's like we know she can be a crusher if she could only like i don't know it's i i so I, i'm not disappointed i'm not surprised um i i and and i i think we will see if if she does gain a little more proficiency on these dynamic movements until she does i don't see these results really changing that much I think you're right. And, and I, you know, so even though, even though she wasn't the only one trying or achieving static beta on some of the dynamic moves in this comp, some of the screen grabs, particularly from qualifiers were just like, it's, you can't even write the comedy. It, it does feel like she's just like leaning into the stereotype about her climbing at this point, because there's sequences where you and I can just look at the wall and say, okay, the sequence is just hop over and, and grab the side pull. And then you see just an image of Aimori completely sideways, like four points straddling from the start over to the, over to the finish volume and uh, not finish volume, but like next hold. Um, and uh, and you just have to say like you couldn't you couldn't illustrate the problem better than 
the type of climbing that we're actually see, seeing her do, right? I think the criticism you gave is is completely fair. And uh, we just see more and more examples of it as time goes by. And I think what we've seen is she is creative enough in her movement that there are times when she's able to figure out these wild static ways of doing these dynamic moves. But I think the route setting is such that she can't, she can't do that every time, right? Okay, maybe on this boulder she figured out how to do it statically, but then on the next boulder, it, it's like that—that mm -hmm. that ability to decipher these these kind of riddle static body positions. That's going to run out, and, and that's what we've seen. Is like it works for some boulders, but it doesn't work for all of them. At some point, you've got to embrace the the parkour uh, dynamic aspect of of where the bouldering discipline is at right now, and she hasn't yet. Yeah, absolutely. How about you say we leave it there? You got anything else you want to add? Any shout outs quick, before Jakarta? Quick honorable mention. I yeah. Giant Kim returned for this World Cup. Am I correct in, in that? Did, I mean, technically, yeah. Yeah. Like she well. was there. <laughs> I guess I guess I think of if somebody says the return of Jane Kim, I'm thinking of podiums. But okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, tip of the hat to her for, for yeah. coming back when we I, I I thought she was fully retired. We got a, we, we got a mom on the circuit. That's cool by itself. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Like if you love competitions and you can get on the national team doesn't matter get in there have a good time like it's great to just see a legend uh, a legend out there i actually yeah. thought you know it was it was a good weekend for korea in general i thought seeing uh doyen lee and jong won chan having having another like you know jong won's not somebody that i consider a consistent finalist at this point anymore he had a great weekend uh, uh given the circumstances so i'm glad korea had something to be excited about glad to see him get on the podium uh you know he doesn't look like the little kid with the bowl cut anymore he's like a handsome young man he's you know like looking stoic on the boulders i thought it was great i was really proud of him that was super cool the circuit is better when Jong Won is hundred percent is performing yeah. at a at a high level because he's so great to watch. He's so charismatic and he you know he's one of those people that he gets to the top and a lot of times he sits there and he like plays yeah. to the crowd a little bit. It's great. It's so good having Jong Won back at in the upper echelon. I hope he stays that way this whole season. It'd be really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's call it there. Appreciate you guys watching. Of course, if you ever get to the end of these episodes, good for you. That's a slog. Uh, make sure you join us on the Plastic Weekly Discord. The link is below. It's where we talk about comps live as they happen. Uh, just, you know, analysis, uh, criticism, whatever's going on. Everybody's just having a good time chatting. Uh, of course, you can always support the show on Patreon. Link is down there as well, where you can get stickers. You can hop on a show with us. Uh, and then lastly, make sure you like and subscribe to this channel. Otherwise, we'll see you next week after Jakarta. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.